Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Davale. It's absolutely a pleasure having you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I don't even know where to start, Davale. Your channel is um, such a wonderful place to learn about everything together. I'm going to be talking about a lot of those things um, that cover different dimensions of data science and data analysis. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about um, how did it all start? Um, your first video was five years ago, um, and you started off by making short videos about Python, um, how to get started, how to install that on a Windows laptop. Uh, walk us through. Sure. So I'm a software engineer slash data engineer. I work at a company called Bloomberg, which is a major financial data and analytics provider uh, here in New York. I mean, I live like one hour away from New York and I I have 17 years of software industry experience. So I use obviously Python and some of the other things that I'm teaching on my channel uh, at my work. Uh, but back in uh, 2011, I was diagnosed with um, an autoimmune disease called ulcerative reticulitis. And it was an uncurable condition. And I was kind of uh, hitting almost a dead end because my health was deteriorating day by day and the whole my emotional state was kind of messed up and i decided that i want to spend whatever free time i have on weekends especially into doing something creative where i kind of help people selflessly and also i should be just enjoying that process so you know for that time duration i'm not thinking about my disease that was the real motivation of starting a youtube channel because i thought youtube is like passive you can do recording on your own. It's not like running a real business, you know? So I would do my regular job. And then on weekends, mostly I would just teach whatever I have been using at work and whatever I have expertise in. So that's how I started um, my YouTube channel. And I started with Python language because Python started picking up, uh, I think, in 2015 it was already picking up and i knew that this is going to be the future and this is something that i should be teaching to people on youtube i think it's such a wonderful thing that if you go through comments on your videos you have almost like a fan fever you know people are so grateful for the information that you give out um, not only in terms of careers in terms of python in terms of deep learning so many playlists um and I, i'm just wondering how do you even manage that um with your uh, disorder uh, and tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I haven't heard about that before. Is it like an autoimmune disease that mm -hmm. you don't have any cure for that? Because I was talking to um, one of the, uh, the prodigy in neuroscience, um, Harrison Canning in the previous episode, and we talked about how neuroscience can make differences in diseases that we cannot yet cure um, and has to do with uh, neuroimmune uh, diseases. Uh, talk us a little bit about that and how do you even find time and, you know, Put yourself in an emotional state where you are able to create um, actually because i've had experiences with some of my close um, friends and relatives who had uh, these diseases and it's not a good thing to have it really takes a toll on your mental health you're absolutely right it definitely took a lot of toll on my health so ulcerative colitis is an autoimmune condition where your immune system starts attacking your colon thinking that it is an outside agent so the kind of complication you get into when you have a transplant, you know, when people have a transplant situation, they give those people a lot of steroids because let's say if you're having heart transplant, the external heart that they have put in your body, your immune system will think it's an outside agent and your Im immune system literally attacks that organ. In my case, what happened was it's my own colon, but my immune system Got, had gone mad due to whatever reason they, medical science has no answer of it so there is some kind of misfunctioning in immune system where it starts thinking that this colon is an outside agent it starts attacking it creates a lot of ulcers throughout the colon you get a lot of bleeding sometimes i go to bathroom and if i look at my you know bathtub it's full of blood and then you have heavy diarrhea so you have to go to bathroom 10 times 15 times you have a lot of urgency, you can't travel. I think people who have Crohn's and colitis, they kind of understand, you know, what I'm talking about. So you kind of get into the state where you're pretty much restricted 
are confined in your home. You're, you lose a lot of weight. I used to weigh 180 pounds. My weight was reduced to 108 pounds. I almost became like half. And when my mom used to call from India, I live in US and when you know, she used to have this video call with me, I wouldn't even show my face. I would just talk because I didn't, I didn't tell her about the situation. She's, you know, moms are very sensitive. So that's the disease and medical science says that we don't know why this happens. All we can do is give you steroids and steroids will suppress your immune system. So it's, it's like a hack. You're not addressing the root cause because you don't know the root cause. And <clears throat> the steroids that I take is called prednisone. It's, it, some people say it's like the most dangerous drug ever invented by humankind because it makes your bones weak. It creates a lot of mood swings. It can, it can destroy you systematically if you keep on taking it for a long time. I have heard cases where people take prednisone and they're sitting in their chair and they, they get a fracture. Your bones become that fragile. So I knew that. If I keep on taking this steroid for a long time, I will probably die one day. It is that bad. But the other option, which is you can't have the inflammation in your colon for a long time because that can potentially create colon cancer or a colon rupture. So both the options that we I had, A and B, they, they both were equally bad. And um, one mistake I did is for long time I relied on allopathy but there's a saying that uh, whenever student is ready uh, a teacher will appear there is a saying in buddhism so I had reached a stage where you know I was doing horrible in terms of my health I was at the rock bottom and I didn't know even if I'm gonna live next five years or not and at that time I started exploring other options like Ayurveda, homeopathy, some of the natural protocols. And I came across this book called Self-Healing Colitis and Crohn's by Dr. David Klein. And that book changed my life. So I just um, started eating raw vegetables and fruits. I was vegetarian throughout my life. But then uh, I went even more extreme. So for this was into 2019, for three months, I was mainly on fruits and vegetables. No grain, no dairy, meat I never tasted in my life. And those three months, my whole body got completely cleaned up. It went through huge transformation. And without any medicines, I become uh, symptom free. So all the colons, colon ulcers are healed now. I become normal. And then for next two years almost, I followed the protocol. I started introducing grain a little bit. And right now I'm in a stage where we are talking in 2022 20, right now, and I'm completely medicine free. I have not visited my GI doctor in past two years and I don't have any symptoms. So it's almost like a miracle. And it, when you talk about autoimmune disease, doctors say that it has to relate, it, it has some relation with your mind as well. Because in many people, the stress will create this disease. So what is the opposite of stress? Well, opposite of, of stress is, well, you know, mental well-being. Yeah, you, you are very happy. You are thrilled about future. And when I did my YouTube channel, when I started teaching people wholeheartedly, my channel kept on growing. I started getting so many wonderful thank you messages. Every day morning, I wake up, I see so many thank you messages. And my sense of purpose became more stronger. My thrill to live became more stronger. And I believe along with the diet, this mental state, this transformed mental condition contributed uh, to the recovery of my health. It's just so amazing and inspiring what you've been able to do after you have, you know, adapted a mindset that, you know, things are 
better than they should be. Um, and not everything is bad. And let's talk a little bit about what you have been able to achieve um, ever since. You started with Python um, coding. And the mathematical ability is just the first thing um, that goes down the drain once you are in a mental state. Um, and that, that's that been a common observation. But you started walking people through the basic concepts, like installing Python, getting started with the functions, arrays, lists. Let's talk about the, your process of making a video, especially when you're teaching someone programming. How do you approach the topic because for many it's a huge problem i mean i've had personally a lot of trouble understanding the syntax um, arrays lists tuples because it's very confusing but your videos are one of the most popular ones on the topic how do you when you're thinking about making a video how do you make videos and how do you plan videos it's a very good question so i consider myself as an average person and um I have worked with multiple big companies, NVIDIA, Bloomberg. And when I talk with some of the smart folks in the, in the company, one trouble I always had was, you know, the people who are very smart, they use all kinds of jargons. They, try, they explain things in a complex way. Some people, if not all, they also want to prove that they are smart. And when you take mentorship from such folks, I, I, I my, myself had a lot of difficulties understanding that problem, uh, those issues or problems, whatever. So I decided that I want to create a YouTube channel where I teach people in a very simple way, often using the real life analogy. When you start learning programming for the first time, it's a paradigm shift, you know, if you think about how, how you think. So if you're doing a big paradigm shift in terms of your thinking, it's important that that shift happens gradually and you use the known concepts or known knowledge that any person have. And that known knowledge is real life analogies. So when I'm at explaining data structures to people, all right, what are data structures? Data structures are basic building blocks of any software programs. So when you are building a house, you have wood, you have um, steel, you know, the bricks, you have these basic building blocks. So similarly, for data structures, arrays, list, uh, linked list, Python, uh, the hash map, trees, these are building blocks and you assemble them in a proper way you can build a home. Similarly, you assemble data structures in a way that you can build a functioning software program. And the most important thing here is you should know when to use which data structure. In any software program, let's say a program requires you to create a unique list of countries. Now, if you use array there, it's gonna work, but you create an array, then you have to remove duplicates. But what if you uh, use set? from your, you know, in, 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 your, in your first attempt, then you are using the right data structure and you are creating a very effective functioning software program. So I explain things by relating it to the real life concepts, real life analogies. I use a lot of motivation um, in my videos because people have a habit of giving up. So it's, it's important you can kind of continuously boost them, motivate them. I interview a lot of people who have made transition. For example, recently I interviewed someone who was a lawyer for 12 years. He learns coding at the age of 37. At the age of 39, he's a software engineer at Google. So I use a lot of those motivation conversation to kind of inspire people and then Python was, in terms of technical topics, Python was the first one which I started, but then I gradually started teaching NumPy, Pandas, machine learning. These are the things that you need to learn step by step if you're planning a career as an ML engineer or a data scientist. Now, going back to your second question, how do I find time? Well, so as I said before, um, if I'm busy, um, in doing these things right now I'm healthy but I'm talking about my days you know when I was having the health struggle it 
it was making youtube videos was actually helping me because we we don't have kids also so me and my wife will have a lot of free time on weekend and if i'm free sitting on internet i would be think you know doing internet search on my disease and then that would even depress me more whenever you have critical critical illness, illness going to google and you know searching about that illness is probably the stupidest thing that one can do because internet wants to put internet will always bring the the bad side of the whole situation for example this book i am talking about i couldn't find that book in the internet such such an amazing book such an amazing diet protocol but internet will not show you that internet will show you things like colon surgery people dying for colon by colon rupture things like that so youtube help me stay away from internet away from distraction and i saw a positive impact on my health so obviously this was a biggest motivation that okay if i want to be healthy i need to do this more and more and then i learned a lot of time management tricks i have a i have a video on my youtube channel if you search by code basics you know how i manage my time between youtube and work you'll find a video where i have talked about lot of uh productivity and time management tips that i use personally to you know do my 9 to 6 job as well as produce content on youtube very interesting um you talk about the work life balance and um i assume it takes a lot of work uh, working in a place like bloomberg um i personally absolutely love their reporting um their financial analysis um their startup news um and everything else and uh, and that certainly takes uh, smart people like you to run a place like this it, it talk us it talk to us about um what your work at bloomberg is um what kind of culture that is how do you find um working there and uh, what's new i have been with bloomberg for well over a decade now and bloomberg is an amazing company to work for uh they are mainly into financial data and analytics so our flagship product is called bloomberg terminal where any investor can go and use various functionality on the terminal to make the investment decision and we provide a premium content so it's not like you're going to google and doing stock analysis on google finance or yahoo finance you know that is for retail investors but if you are serious about your investment like a lot of portfolio managers banks they use terminal because we provide a premium content and premium analytics so the day to day life is dealing with a lot of data basically a lot of financial data and um you know massaging it cleaning it generating insights and putting it on bloomberg terminal so that our investors can consume them really fast and make their decisions very quick and time to market is also very very important so my role in my current team is that of a software engineer or you can call it data engineer i do a lot of like it is kind of like a mix of software engineer data engineer data scientist you know when you're working in a big company you don't have you don't work in silos you kind of mul- wear multiple hats so we work on my group works on data extraction basically extracting data from financial documents massaging it you know removing outliers basically uh, bringing it in a stage that that is consumable that the data is consumable you also generate analytics and we use python a lot of other cool technologies and overall it's a fun place to work you interact with a lot of smart people in my company there are people who are there's one guy who's a python steering council member for example there are people who represent in uh, c++ plus plus standards committee you know there are folks who run projects like jupiter lab jupiter lab which is a next generation next version of jupiter notebook that is like officially sponsored by bloomberg so you will find people who are in a jupiter notebook steering committee and who happen to be bloomberg employees as well 
So Bloomberg spends a lot of money on uh, open source. And uh, as I said, like there are many smart people and it's overall a lot, lot of uh, learning opportunities. I mean, there hasn't been a single day in the last 10 years where, you know, I haven't learned a new thing. It's very obvious from the kind of videos that you make, it covers pretty much the whole spectrum of um, data science and data engineering. For example, you have di um, dived not into not only into data science, but also data engineering, the Tableau and Power BI uh, videos that you've made. Um, you've also talked about um, carrier and other things, but let's um, talk uh, from bottom um, to up. Um, so the very basic level of data analysis or you know, people generally start from, is learning from a Microsoft Excel and playing with um, batch data uh, in Tableau or Power BI, creating reports and dashboards. And you've made videos about that. So someone was just getting started um, in data science and you know, first level is the data visualization and uh, munging part. Uh, talk to us a little bit about those videos and uh, how important do you think that skill is? Sure. So data science has uh, multiple career tracks. Uh, one is data engineer, data analyst, data scientist. Data engineer is more on a software engineering side. Data analyst and data scientist, they are more on the actual data science, ML and analysis part. They need to have a lot of business understanding as well. So uh, if you go to YouTube and search for core basics data analyst roadmap or core basics data scientist roadmap, You'll find my, um, you know, roadmaps which I have I have put on my GitHub, along with the uh, free resources. Well, good good thing about, uh, you know, today is there there are so many resources available on internet where you can learn things for free. So if someone wants to make a career, uh, once you explore Excel and Python and you know NumPy, Pandas, a little bit data munging. And then Power BI, Tableau, obviously, building some dashboarding uh, skills comes next. Then comes uh, machine learning, where you start learning about statistical machine learning using sklearn. Now, when you learn that, you will come across a lot of mathematical and statistical concepts. So you, let's say, learn linear regression, okay? Now, linear regression, Okay, it's, there will be some method in sklearn, but there is math side to it. So now you go to maybe, uh, there's this YouTube channel called Three Blue, One Brown, which I like the most. They teach, he teaches math in a really good way using visualization. So I would go to Three B, One B channel, get my concepts on linear regression clear from there. There is another statistics channel called StatQuest. There is a math website for learning math called Math is Fun. So these are the resources I like personally. So you go there, clear your mathematical concept, come back, start coding in sklearn, you know, take some data set from Kaggle, which is a platform to learn data science, to compete into data science competitions and learn sklearn. That would be your statistical machine learning. And once you have done a little bit of that, you can move to deep learning, which is using neural networks to solve even more complex problems where you can use natural language processing and computer vision uh, to solve a variety of problems. And I have videos and projects on my YouTube channel, but this is like a very brief summary of your step-by-step -step approach. If someone wants to become data scientist, for data engineer, data analyst, the tracks will be a little different, although there will be a lot of overlap, so I have all those roadmaps available on my YouTube channels. If someone searches with, with on YouTube, just go search code basics, then data analyst code basics, data scientist roadmap, and you'll find that a complete roadmap there. Um, I think one of the great things that you do is that most people, when they make videos about their science, um, they make only videos about um, data science. Some people do not take people from the bottom and they take from them up upwards you um on the other hand also make videos that will clear their concepts um, on the bigger picture for example you have a playlist on um, algorithm the data structures 
um, which is kind of the core concept uh, for a lot of engineers. I mean, we have a lot of people in our company, data scientists, data engineers who are applying for these things. Um, and they generally think that, you know, not understanding these concepts is probably okay. But at some point, you know, they hit a very hard stop. Um, because they don't understand um, how data structures can help um, optimize the model, or is it worth deploying or not? Talk a little bit about that playlist. Sure. Data structure and algorithm are the most important thing if you want to build a career as a software engineer or a data scientist. You know, Einstein has this famous quote that um, politics is for the moment, but equation is for eternity. I say the same thing about data structure. Data structures and algorithms are for eternity. I have, I have started. I, I started working um, in Pascal programming language. You know, this was way back. I'm much older than what I look, but then Pascal to C, C plus plus, Visual C plus plus, then JavaScript, Python. Languages change. The syntax change. What has remained constant is data structures and algorithms. And if a person has a sound knowledge of both of these, then it's just a matter of learning syntax, which anyone can do. You don't require intelligence for that. You can just simply Google in Python. I want to read, let's say di directory and read all the files. Just Google it. Look at the first tech overflow answer. You will find the perfect code snippet. What you will not be able to do Google search on is he is the given problem what is the right data structure and algo I should be writing? Should I be writing these two for loops or should I be first storing this data into a hash map and then doing further transformation uh, to bring it into a next stage so that I can solve my given problem? That decision-making ability, that sense of using the right thing for a right problem will come if a person has a sound knowledge of data structures and algorithm. So in my playlist, that's the emphasis I'm putting that guys and girls, this is the most important thing. And I try to explain things in a very simple way. I, I write Python code. I also, by the way, I have exercise in all of my videos. So I ask people to practice as well because that's equally important. Coding is all about practicing. It's like swimming. By watching video, you're not going to learn it. You know, you have to practice it. Do you also have this problem at Bloomberg? Because you know, I I have a theory about this that 90% of machine learning models never actually get deployed. And you know, the failure rate is very high in uh, machine learning projects. And I have a gut feeling that that has to do with something with engineers and capability to understand that data structure and algorithm is a very important thing. And you need to find the time and space complexity of your model before you um, actually go further. And they try to you know improve their accuracy by every small um, improvement um, in different statistical methods, not realizing that sometimes simplest solution is probably the best solution. What's your take on that? I totally agree. Um, I always say that if a regular expression can solve your problem, don't use ML. So this theory, first of all, I don't know how true this is where people say 90% of machine learning projects fail. Uh, I'm not, it's a controversial topic. Maybe not on Bloomberg, but you know, that's a very common perception. You know, I've read reports mm. on that, you know, there's a huge percentage, mm. even if that's not 90%, that's certainly very high for um, a lot of initiatives. Mm. It is very high because you know you have hired a bunch of ML engineers and they just want to use ML by hooks and crooks. They they are like, you know, they almost have this ego problem that we are ML engineers, we need to be building ML solution. But many times I've seen things can be solved without using ML. So if things can be solved without you without ML by using deterministic programming, see there's a difference between a traditional programming and ML. Traditional programming is very de deterministic and it is good actually. It will give you a very correct answer for a given problem. ML is kind of little vague, you know, it's, it's, it's like our human brain. It's not like here I have a, let's say GPT-3. GPT-3 is a complex model, okay? Here I have this model. I mean, I cannot represent that model 
using an equation. I mean, I can, because if you think about those billions of neurons and weights, and if you do the weighted sum and sigmoid and all that, maybe you can come up with a, with like 50 mile long equation is <laughs> possible, but still, it's still, it's, it's like human brain, which is kind of vague and working on intuitions and things like that. So um, if you can solve a given problem using regular expression, using traditional software, you should always try that because that's the best option you have. Doing ML, first big problem, requires a lot of data for your supervised learning. Many organizations don't have that luxury. Maybe Google and Amazon and Big Tech have huge collection of data. Many organizations don't have that luxury. Now you build excellent model, but your data set is poor, you know? That's not gonna help. So I see that in the industry, many times ML engineers driving those decisions is number one problem. And number two problem is even the business stakeholders, they want to have ML in their slide deck because they want to impress their management. If you don't have ML in your slide deck, you're not doing anything new. And so what's gonna happen when you're due for your next promotion? So I see a lot of politics being played, played around this ML area. And I, I still think there are so many problems that we can solve really well without using ML. Now, when it comes to ML, first of all, ML is hard. Let's accept that. Someone goes learn scikit-learn. You know, okay, how to create logistic regression, dot fit, you know, dot, dot score. Oh, I have 97% accuracy. That's the stupidity. ML is, in order to become a good ML engineer, you need to have solid mathematical foundation. You need to have good understanding of when to use which algorithm you need to do a lot of dirty work you know they say data scientists spend 80 percent of their time in data cleaning and data cleaning when it comes to real life is a lot of dirty work and people don't want to do that or people do it in a wrong way and then they blame that this ml project is a failure well ml project is a failure because your data pipeline is totally screwed up and you don't have proper I think data engineers or software engineers who are doing that data cleaning work, which is the prerequisite of uh, before you prerequisite before you start building the ML model. And uh, yeah, so talent talent is also another issue as, as I already mentioned. Uh, the best ML engineers, yeah, they could be working in Amazon, Google. These are the big companies which which can pay really high, but mid like tier two, tier three companies, when you hire any ML engineers or data scientists, you, re you really need to be careful, you know, what kind of people you are hiring and what kind of solutions they are building. And the whole space, to be honest, is very new. So sometimes you're trying to set up a new department and new data science department, let's say in your company, you hire a bunch of uh, junior people. And now there are no seniors who who, who, who can train them. There's no maturity overall, you know, in the, in the industry, as far as this space is concerned. So I feel like this is still evolving, but next five to 10 years, we will see a huge adoption of ML and data science. There will be more maturity. And I think this failure rate will go significantly down. I'm glad you talked about immaturity in the whole space, because, you know, I got a lot of bad rap for, um, being honest and, you know, call a spade a spade. Um, for example, there's a huge debate between um, these newly spawning um, Kaggle grandmasters um, and experts, um, and they think Kaggle is everything. And what I try to tell them is that um, Kaggle makes your 80% of your work in real life um, it disappears on Kaggle. You don't have to clean the data. You don't have to understand the complexities of data. You don't have to go through the ETL pipelines. Um, and it seems like it falls flat. You know, it's, everyone wants to be a grandmaster um, because that's probably the easiest way to get into NVIDIA and other places. But it seems very naive and shallow to me at some point. What's your take on Kaggle versus real life? Absolutely, I agree with you because Kaggle is Kaggle. It's not like working in corporate. You know, you are not working with various stakeholders when you're working in real life in big corporate 
and there are a lot of things at play there is corporate politics you know you need to please certain people you need to motivate some other people you have variety of data sources you know your structured data might be in oracle postgres then you might have some unstructured data on amazon s3 buckets in form of your json objects or mongodb whatever so the you know the skill that you need to have is how do you organize yourself or how do you work amicably with different parties where you pull in all the data that you need then you come up with the right design you how do you uh design your product increments you know how do you come up with first mvp how do you measure the success of that mvp and create the second phase of your project all of these things are missing on kaggle kaggle is okay they provide you some data set you write some fancy notebook you know you have results you participate in competitions but um uh, of course it's it's not corporate life i have seen many cases where based on the kaggle performance people get job offers which is good i mean it shows that you have got some skills but of course it cannot replace the experience that you would have in real life what do you think kaggle should do to improve the seamless transition from um its uh, glorious competitions to real life uh so i'll be honest here first of all i know about kaggle but i have not personally competed like participate in competitions and things like that so i wouldn't say i'm like fully aware about the platform and i know that there are companies who put the uh, competitions right on the kaggle and then people participate in that so i think whatever they're doing is probably the best thing i mean there's always a scope of improvement but to be honest like i don't have any solid ideas maybe maybe they can do something to uh increase the collaboration between the people who are working in industry uh and and the people who are working on kaggle so for example let's say if bloomberg has to solve xyz problem maybe they launch a kaggle competition they provide all the resources couple of people start participating it and and i don't know if you can correct me if this is happening once the competition is out once people have started participating is there a continuous collaboration between let's say bloomberg as a company and those kaggle car- participants probably not i don't think you know, what happens is collaboration generally i mean as far as i know i mean i started competing but you know then i found that it really does not mimic um the real life and you know kind of give it up but what happens is that companies um and different institutions give out their data sets um and they have test and um training data sets available but they do not have the validation data sets um so what they do is that um the the participants i play with the data you know come up with the models and accuracy and put that on the leaderboard and see where do they actually stand with the test one but you know there is one data set that's held by the company itself to see you know if the model is actually generalizing on rest of it also and there's you know some prizes also $1000 or $500,000 you know various ones and then based on your ranking position you get gold medals or bronze medal and things like this which is pretty good um but to assume like you said uh, if you were to spin a question in a different way if you were hiring some for bloomberg and you wanted to have a data scientist and they come from um kaggle what would you do to actually you know create um a litmus test to find mm-hmm. out you know if these guys just can only perform on kaggle or in real life as well yeah so i would have um i would not just give them data set and just wait for the results you know i would i would have continuous uh, engagement i think engagement is needed because in real life in corporate companies big companies you start with problem a and by the time you are you know you have built something some dirty solution you have already revised your problem statement you know you have learned few things by doing those early experiment where your requirements have changed your problem statement have changed so if we can incorporate the element of engagement in kaggle where i post a competition i look at the results based on the result i pivot 
And now, okay, here's my new problem statement. And then I want to see how, how good a person is in understanding the new problem statement, in adjusting to the new needs, often in providing the new ways or new ideas uh, in solving the problem given the new situation. So I would like to see that flexibility. And if this platform can provide that, then that would be awesome. That can become a very good hiring platform. Then I don't need to call person for an interview, maybe based on Kegel competition itself. Uh, we can we can have like most of this decision. Uh, I know there are companies who hire people based on stack overflow. Uh, I'm not speaking for my company, of course, but I have seen generally there are companies who provide who hire based on let's say stack overflow ranking. So if a person has is he's in a like let's say C plus plus in this category, let's say this person's ranks is this much, just by reading the answers and you know, looking at those uh, solutions or code snippet, you can make a lot of a decision. And then, of course, you have to go through the formal rounds, but later process becomes much easier once you have that solid foundation in your first step itself. Fascinating. You should say that, you know, I was having a conversation with um, Chief uh, decision scientist at Target, uh, Frank Oregon, who was on my podcast a couple of months ago, and we were talking about just exactly the same thing that you just talked about to communicate with the data scientists when you're hiring them. And he has a huge team of data scientists and data analysts and business um, analysts. And when he tries to hire someone, one of the things that he actually notices um, is the ability for these engineers or data scientists to, to communicate. And that's a huge perennial problem in the data science world. I guess it has to do something with the natural sciences and the social sciences. You know, people who come from natural sciences, they don't spend too much time um, working with other people and communicating. You know, most of the time is spent in their head and not, you know, with other people. And in my experience, uh, it's a nightmare working with someone who's not able to explain themselves what they're trying mm. to do and we're trying to achieve. And it's like a stonewall situation. Have you had this kind of experience? And what do you recommend that we do something about that in our education system or let's say online learning that people are able to communicate what they're thinking as well and you know walk other people with them um, who are a little bit slower or come from a different field so there has a sense of you know going together instead of you know two opposite forces there is a huge loss of productivity even in today's world due to in clear communication not having a good communication is creating so many issues. It's a prevalent problem in the industry. And I would say it doesn't matter if your role is data scientist or programmer. I think in any role, you need to have a solid communication. And one of the biggest issue with current education system today is they don't spend too much time in improving people's communication skill. They would, for example, you look at any master's course in data science or let's say BTEC, you know, I'm from India general BTEC four-year program, if you look at it, you will have courses in engineering mathematics, Python, data structures, databases, computer architecture. I personally, I did not have any specific course on communication. So if you have specific course on communication where they teach you how to communicate effectively, how to negotiate with people, there is a book, called How to Win Friends and Influence People. You, you are probably aware about that book. Everyone if, is. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately not. Really? <laughs> very, very few people have read those books. I mean, okay. I talk with so many engineering grads uh, through my YouTube channel. I, I interact with so many people. Hardly, I have suggested this book to so many people. I, I don't think I have found even one person who have read that. So... If, let's say now that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, why can't they have that book in an engineering curriculum, you know? It should be one of the subjects in your first, first year of engineering, or maybe start even before engineering, maybe in your 11th or 12th grade. So they don't do that. And because of that, people lack these subtle communication skills, you know, how to handle someone else's ego. So let's say if I'm working in an engineering team, I'm calling some API and I have dependency on the other team 
Now I'm talking with that person on phone and I don't know how to handle the communication. I don't know how to do ego management, negotiation. And because of that, you know, that person wouldn't be willing to help me and my project might get delayed. So I definitely, I, I, I see this issue a lot in today's world where people don't communicate well. And that's one of the reason of uh, the productivity loss and anything that, you know, either at corporate level or in the education system, anything that we can do to improve this communication would be awesome. I don't even know if in corporate world, we, uh, you know, we put enough focus on training people in terms of communication, even big companies. I've been living in the US. I've seen many big corporate companies. They would have training programs where they would teach you DevOps skills and Python skills and all kinds of skills, but they don't teach you communication skills. It's like so sad. Uh, so yeah, it, there is a need from both corporate and academia where they have to put enough focus on improving people's communication skills. And when I say communication, it's all like verbal, uh, written communication, even um, presenting. There is this nice talk on YouTube called Death by Power PowerPoint. It's a very excellent talk. Uh, it's video. such a wonderful uh, video. I think it's based on a book. You know, I, whenever I read that, it's um, it's always enlightening. And the tips that he's talking about in that video are they are very very simple tips. You don't need need to learn anything new. You know, he's talking about okay, if you have five points to discuss, don't put five lines in one slide because now you're talking about first point. Your entire audience is just reading through other points. No one is paying attention to you. Why don't you have five slides with one point each? But then people say, oh, my slides will become more. But hey, you're talking about the same points. I'm talking about five points. For each point, I'm, I'm spending 30 seconds. So does it matter if there is one slide versus five slides? No. Now, such a simple thing. And I have... I have been telling this to many people, you know, whom, with whom I'm interacting. And unfortunately, this is the rule of life. Unfortunately, people don't want to learn. I've seen, I've advised many people who, with whom I, I interact on a regular basis. I've advised them that don't do this mistakes, you know, like watch this video is kind of cool, you know, makes sense. And they agree. But next time when I see them presenting, they don't improve. I think there's a very famous quote that I read somewhere that, you know, in, um, um, and I remember who said that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Naval Ravikant. Um, such a wonderful um, thinker. He's been on Joe yes. Rogan's podcast also. And he talks about the fact that, you know, in today's day and time, um, it's not the knowledge that's scarce. It's the curiosity and will to learn that's becoming so scarce that, you know, people don't even want to learn. I mean, think about someone um, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. I mean, they would die for this kind of information. It would give them um, a head start um, better than kings. Kings don't have this information system that we have today. Anyone can go on Google and type anything from any part of the world and they would learn those things. And one of the things that you talk about um, on your channel and that um, is so powerful um, and inspiring is the fact you don't tell people only about Python, data structures, deep learning, you also tell them about life and how to negotiate and pedal through different circumstances. And one of those things is a salary negotiation. Um, and I think that's a, such a huge um, hole in, in, in the whole um, finding job scenario where people don't even know how to negotiate, especially in US. I mean, you can probably um, talk about that uh, in a little bit of detail where people have very short margin to make errors, especially with international students working towards H1B visas. So if there are 10 companies, there are only one company that's probably um, offering H1B visa, B1 visa and negotiating salary with them is even harder. So it's, it's such a crucial time for people to be able to negotiate salary. Tell us a little bit about that, about um, the H1B visa thing and um, a lot of other issues that people face when, in, when it comes to negotiating the better deal for themselves. I have seen that often 
the programmers, you know, they're so much stuck into their programming life or their tech life that they miss on these soft skills, which is like how to negotiate with HR or even how to talk with HR. And all these tools have come up with, you know, like the, there is, there is this website called levels.fyi, which shows you the different salaries per you know, different roles and categories in, in various companies. So if you want to know, okay, how much an SDE level one or SDE level two gets at Amazon, you can go to that website, find it out. And the same portal provides salary negotiation service. I think that is an interview Kickstarter. There are a couple of other platforms as well where they would tell you how to negotiate salary. So you do a consulting with them, you know, they charge maybe $100 or $200, whatever. And they will exactly teach you how to negotiate the salary with HR. And I had, I had, I had a fan who used that portal and he was amazed, you know, he was able to negotiate salaries uh, such that, you know, you can increase it by in, in the level of like 100K or 50K, something like that, which is, which is a hundred, K dollars, you know, per year in US, it's, it's a big deal. So let's say they were saying 400. Now you, you took this $200 service and you were able to raise your salary from 400K a year to 500K. It's a big deal, right? Um, so learning these skills uh, is important. And you said it very right. In past age, whatever information was available, even not available to Kings, you have that information available. So now, it's up to you. There's a saying, uh, the art of getting things done is to act. Information, knowledge, everything is there. The only thing that is needed is action. And one downside of having so much information on the internet today is people spend most of the time consuming information and less time in taking action. I think that has become a bigger problem in today's era. I post any motivational video on YouTube, you know, like I, there was one guy who cracked like 10 job offers. He got a job at Amazon, Facebook, Google, like 10 big companies at the same time. That video got so many views on my channel. I posted a video on bagging and boosting in Python, very technical topic. Those videos hardly get any views because those videos are about action. You know, you need to do, do coding in that. The other video is all about motivation and learning things, you know, like hearing nice things, feeling happy at the end of the it. Bagging boosting video is like you have to do the work, you know, it's about getting things done. So that's the issue with today's world. And I talk a lot about uh, these topics on my channel, where I talk about your biggest distraction in your life, which is a cell phone, like how to avoid getting distracted for, uh, from cell phone and how to avoid getting distracted from all kinds of content. Because let's say if you're using YouTube to learn salary negotiation, for example, and there's this video on, on levels.fyi that you find. Once you're done watching the video, YouTube will immediately show you so many lucrative video tips. You will, you will click on one video after the other. You have spent six hours consuming all the content but you have hardly digested anything. There is this person who has a Guinness Book of World Record in a memorization. His name is Nisan Kati Barla. He, he also gave a nice TED talk about how to learn things faster. And his point is, in my learning process, let's say if I'm learning something for one hour, I would spend only 15 minutes in actually consume, consuming the content. It could be watching YouTube video. It could be reading book. F only 15 minutes. Then remaining 45 minutes, spend in thinking over it. Let's say I learned about bagging or boosting. You know, I have this notebook. So I'm reading the book. If I learned about bagging, I would literally write down in the notebook what I learned. I will try to connect the dots so that those neurons in my brain, you know, they can they can create those connections so that the concept becomes clear in my head. So the first part was consuming content, give minimum time to that, maybe 15 minutes, remaining 45 minutes, spend in three activities. Number one, uh, reflect, reflect what you learned, you know, 
use not and pen whiteboard discuss with your friends then the second part is implement it so if i taught you bagging maybe work on bagging exercise bagging boosting like try to get some data set from kegel apply bagging boosting and see you know what results you see and the third most important thing is sharing with people which is what i have been doing on youtube many times i learn new concepts myself something i have tried for the first time and immediately i make a video on it because they say the best way of learning something is to start teaching so less time in consuming the content more time in reflecting implementing and then sharing if you follow this discipline i think you can learn things real faster i know we distracted a little bit but i uh, did did that answer your question absolutely and actually um, i had boris conrad who is a three time memory champion um in germany speaks uh, almost eight nine languages um and he's a neuroscientist at donner's institute and we talked about memorizing things um for example he could memorize um a full deck of cards in 30 seconds and then he can you know um tell you which card you which by you know each, you know flipping it one by one and one of the beautiful things that he talked about that how our brain works and it's so plastic that it learns everything that you put it through continuously so he said that you know you should reflect on whatever you're thinking so there are different tools there's a mind palace that you can think of different objects as palaces and you can number them assign your memories with them and you can remember that and then there is mnemonics um and one of the techniques is to create a story out of whatever you're learning um that is both funny or inspiring or something that sticks and this is how you remember things uh, for a long um time and it's wonderful that you talk about you know not only consuming knowledge but also producing knowledge for others whatever you're sharing because in my case what happened is when i shared this um, linkedin post or um on twitter there's always someone who at least you know appreciates you or corrects you and both in both ways you know it, it's a good thing you know either you correct yourself um or for example if i didn't share that information i would just believe that that's correct and no one would actually um correct it unless i mm-hmm. would have found out the hard way and one other way to um, replenish uh, remember information is good sleep um and hobbies that make you happy and in your case you work a lot in your vegetable garden um you mm-hmm. also are a vegetarian uh, talk us a little bit about that um and you should inspire me to you know use more vegetables also because i'm becoming a huge meat lover for some reason <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have a nice backyard and I grow vegetables. So I live in New Jersey, unfortunately. I can only like 4 months to grow my vegetables. So I have nice land which I I prepare in the spring and then I grow tomatoes, uh, different kind of beans, uh some bitter melon, uh different kind of gourds, you know, which are very good for your health. uh so i i grow those vegetables and the the feeling of picking up a fresh vegetables you know right before cooking is amazing so let's say my wife is making a potato capsicum curry she would tell me hey do go outside and pick some capsicums i would go and pick the fresh capsicum that the skin is like so nice and clear the taste you see a humongous difference uh when you eat that versus a store bought vegetables sometimes we say that hum- we humans are making a progress we live in a progressive society but when i look at my own childhood you know 30 30, 30 years back when i grew up in a very small town of india where i did not have even a tv you know electricity was something we got like when i was 5 year old so it was like very primitive village and i felt like we had so much luxuries at that time because everything was grown organically there were no chemicals we had our own farm we had our own buffaloes we would go to farm pick up vegetables my mom would milk those buffaloes we make butter the ghee and all kind of dairy uh, items at home and everything like the whole ecosystem you know my, my the buffaloes uh, would eat the grass which grows in my own farm which doesn't have any chemicals and so we know that the milk that we are eventually drinking 
is purely organic. And that whole ecosystem was so good. And I often miss those childhood days. So I'm lucky to have this space behind my home where I can grow some vegetables. It's not ideal because here it's like too cold. So I just get it for a few months. But it's one of my dream that at, at some point I want to move back to India. I want to have my own. Yeah, just imagine, you know, like I have my nice YouTube studio uh, near to my farm. I'm doing my work, YouTube channel. And then, uh, you know, I go to my farm. farm. Remaining time I, I spend farming and eating those fresh produce. Right now for exercise, you know, you go to gym and you do all kinds of activities. And sometimes going to gym, I feel like it's stupid. I should probably have a farm and I should be working in farm. <laughs> It's just so wonderful. You know, I lived in Sweden for a long time and it's kind of very hard to explain to white people what organic food is like and what's the joy in growing it and consuming it. Just sort of, they don't understand it. I mean, I think it's second, third generation. Um, they're having food from packaged resources and, you know, milk is in the box. Um, and in US, I guess that's a huge issue with GMO foods. Uh, so they don't realize the importance and joy of um, having um, organic food, um, which at least um, I'm very happy. I'm kind of living the dream that you are dreaming at the moment. You know, came back and you know I had um, live in a small city where I could go out and buy organic food right from the farmers. You know, have the milk from them. Um, and uh, but I'm just wondering. Um, I read a book um, some time ago um, by a wonderful um, investor, and it is the name of the book is called Tando Investor, and that's by an Indian writer. And in that I know, book, I, read I know about that book. Yes, such a fantastic book. And he wrote about the fact that most patels in India they have like motel businesses or on the highway and things like this. And I was just wondering, um, did you lost path of patels? And you know, how did you get into data science? <laughs> That's a very good question. My team lead in my last company used to ask me the question: "Is like, what is this Patel software engineer doing in my company? You you should be running a motel." Well. <laughs> Uh, I know although like there are many motels run by Patels, but Patels do many other interesting things as well. And I'm one of those. So yeah, there are many Patels who are in software industry. <laughs> my, my father was a teacher. We didn't have any business background. I completed my computer science studies and I started, you know, when you are from that background where everyone is in, in, in your family is an employee, you also want to become an employee. You, you will be like, okay, who wants to take a risk with the business? So I started working and I have been working since I were, but my brother, um, he was courageous enough and I kind of supported him. So he started uh, a software company and at least he's doing uh, the, the business, although it's not Mortel, but he's keeping up with that Patel expectation that, okay, you got to do business in your life. <laughs> so Sam was living up the hype actually. <laughs> but let's get back to um, the enduring side of things. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, probably the most uh, famous, uh, or let's say overhyped um, area of for artificial intelligence, deep learning. And you've made your um, videos, which I've been binge watching um, for many days now, uh, where you talk about uh, TensorFlow and Keras um, and TensorBoard and a lot of things that are involved in deep learning, taking people from the basic concepts into the complicated um, deep neural um, network um, architecture. Talk us to us. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what deep learning is. Um, is it? as justified as people are crazy about that, uh, because that seems to be in search trend to say to be on top. It's very popular um, among young data scientists, um, probably because of NVIDIA and Tesla and other companies. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, sure. So deep learning is amazing. Deep learning uh, in academics at least has been there uh, since long time. When I did my college last year project, which was back in 2003, which is 17, 18 years back, it was in deep learning. It was about implementing backpropagation algorithm in C++. So a lot of these mathematical concepts and theory around deep learning has been there since ages. But what changed in the last five years is in order to make deep learning effective, you need humongous uh, amount of training data. 
so that training data has been made available in last five years you know because of internet social media iot devices producing so much information we have easy access of data number two the open source libraries it took me six months to implement back propagation algorithm it was my last year project so it was not just back propagation algorithm but there was some other work as well but it took me long time to do that work uh, back in 2003 right now if i want to do the same thing i need to write only five line of code so the whole python uh, tensorflow open source ecosystem has made things much easier and number three is hardware i have this nvidia titan R rtx gpu right now uh, so this gpu that you're seeing this is titan rtx one of the high-end gpus of, of nvidia if you don't have that and if you are training your model it might take long time you know half an hour one hour based on your uh, type of your training job with this you can perform same training in seconds so when i'm working on any deep learning task it's an iterative process you know you need to fine tune your parameters train again train again you're doing this so so many times and if i don't have this you know i don't want to wait like one hour every time i go through a small iteration but because of this i can do so many iterations basically all these factors combined have contributed to the rapid growth of deep learning and the the hype is worth it actually you come to us here in new york amazon has opened uh, this amazon go store you might have seen youtube video on that which is totally uh, you know like self sufficient store like there are no employees literally so you walk in the store i mean it can, kind of sounds scary in terms of you know when it comes to politics and employment and all of that but let's keep that aside you walk in the store pick up an item there are there are cameras behind it there is in computer vision to identify what item you picked up you know they use computer vision sensors iot nlp and your entire shopping experience is so smooth you pick things up you just walk out it will scan and it will identify that this is person x it will uh, build to your account and it will track your uh, shopping in a very very accurate manner uh, another thing is a tesla driverless car my friend has a tesla car and um, he and his family went to a store one day and it was raining and his park was parked part so far away he has a small kid who had coal he didn't want to walk to that car with the entire family i mean he could have walked and pulled the car over there but then since he had a tesla he summoned his car and it was raining dark so many people walking uh, on the street tesla car came all the way on its own to him you know tesla has this fee summon the car it can come to you it is so accurate you know the so all of this is possible because of deep learning with deep learning we are kind of getting the accuracy that you would get uh, you know basically the accuracy that you would get with a human brain i mean i have a very cool um, ai technology that we can i can show you right now while while we are recording which is called nvidia broadcast so as i'm speaking oh, that's so wonderful you know if you could actually demonstrate that i found it very interesting when i saw your video then you, know, you can clap and do everything and it's just going to fill it out everything let's try that <laughs> yeah so right now so let me explain so here uh my microphone is this yeti microphone you know usual microphone this is plugged into my computer that so my the voice goes into my computer right and then uh there is this nvidia card uh, rtx and that card along with a software called nvidia broadcast will filter out any noise so i'm clapping right now i'm clapping literally clapping can you hear it not at all <laughs> not at all you could have a person beating drum behind me you will not hear it there is a funny video on youtube where you know a video of baby crying by the way it's kind of funny 
there is a video of baby crying which has 13 million views can you believe that and baby crying sound one hour long video all right so i'll play it right now so i have my phone and uh, at a full full volume level see and you did you hear baby crying or you were just hearing me yeah i was just hearing you yeah and if you uh just change it my usual yeti microphone and now see i'm talking i have not changed anything <laughs> and you see right yeah now you know work from his home situation people have kids you know they might be crying this is a real application of deep learning see it, it's so effective it can make your life so much better so deep learning is penetrating into our life and you, if you want to talk about some of the technical aspects basically it uses a concept of neural network and deep learning is little different than statistical learning so when you have a neural network you have bunch of neurons which are connected through edges and then you have layers of neurons and they kind of work in a they don't work exactly in a same way that a human brain works but you can compare their performance with human brain performance where let's say if you're using uh, and there are by the way different types of neural networks uh, they use convolutional neural network or cnn for computer vision task so if you want to identify an image let's say there is there is a koala image you know i use the koala example in my convolutional neural network example the way we recognize koala is we do feature detections so our our neurons you know it's like a multiple workers working on individual task so one worker is identifying fine koala's eyes one other worker is identifying koala's nose so everyone is extracting different features and we aggregate those features and those decisions into a single decision that okay if this image has koala's eyes nose hands and legs it means it's a koala image i know i i i am making it sound very very simple but again you can watch that video there is math and there is like we apply filtering there are so many technical details that goes into that but the point is uh deep learning and neural networks uh, have been able to solve so many complex problems that you couldn't solve with using either your traditional software or even your statistical machine learning models nowadays gans you know uh, gan that's a different type of neural network they these are like generative neural networks and gpt3 which is a famous neural network uh, produced by open ai which made a lot of big news uh, is one of those generative networks where it can write a poem you know it can get into creative activity i was reading a poem written by gpt3 on elon musk and it was so good you would feel like some professional poet written that poem so just google you know elon musk written by gpt3 you will find that so they are able to do a lot of amazing things there are so many concerns that comes up um, uh related to employment how it's going to impact our life and so on and of course we need to tackle some of those issues you know ethics regulation etc but if you keep those things aside if you look at the bright side of it it is able to solve so many difficult problems you know you, you look at healthcare um it's making huge advancements in terms of disease prediction so before even you are officially diagnosed with let's say cancer uh, you can use deep learning to kind of get the signals that okay you have this probability and maybe you can take some corrective action so that you don't uh, go down that road eventually um, it's amazing that you um have um talked about such use cases in deep learning that has almost revolutionized the way that we predict diseases we drive our cars um we manufacture things um there are huge applications for uh, fraud detection and things like this but there's also on the other side 
serious concerns appearing, like you said yourself, about um, AI ethics in the black box. And um, I was just wondering, what are your views on um, Andrew Ng's new proposed direction in AI, which is not towards um, an ML centric research, but also, but now data centric research. For what I, what I mean is that, you know, we are hitting a point where the gains in um, neural network um, research is only uh, minimalistic. For example, uh, from ImageNet, Im accuracy is improving by half a point or one point or 1.5 point with all these new models like Open um, AI's GPT-3 um, or the Chinese model. Um, it, it's not huge strides like 15% accuracy with some new kind of model optimization or 20% accuracy on the same data set. So the gains are kind of hitting the wall there. So, but what he suggested that instead of focusing on that side, um, why shouldn't we actually focusing on finding out um, healthy data, um, accurate data, and easily available data that, I mean, probably there you have a bigger margin of improvement instead of, you know, focusing on the marginal improvements on the um, ML and deep learning research side. I think Andrew Eng is doing amazing work and terms of thought leadership in the AI industry overall. Being data centric is probably the best idea that has happened so far, because uh, we've already seen examples where we train a NLP model and the model is racist, you know, because you would have used all the tweets and all the text from the internet and we see a lot of biases. So those biases get reflected in, in the way your model behaves. So model is just, just the mathematical or the scientific component to it. It's like garbage in, garbage out type of situation. So the data that you want to fit in, you have to make sure uh, it's, you know, if you're talking about natural language processing, the language is neutral, it's not racist. Uh, there is a huge uh, wave of diversity and inclusion going on in the industry today where people have started renaming their GitHub branches from master to main because master uh, points to master slave, you know, kind of terminology. Uh, and I see a lot of good initiatives happening on, on, on this front. And I agree that being data centric uh, becoming data centric is going to make much more sense. But at the same time, if you're talking about pure ML, I still see a lot of advancements happening in ML world. You know, you come from the world of LSTM to uh, bidirectional LSTM to uh, transformers. And if you look at all these evolutions, uh, they have happened in a very short duration of time. So I personally think that there would be advancements in both the fronts, but I agree with him that it should, we sh as a society should become more data centric because as I said, it's machine learning is all about, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? It's when, when you talk about machine learning, deep learning, 80% of time you are talking about supervised learning. And what is supervised learning? Well you have trading data set, you're trying to capture patterns from it and you're building a model that can reflect the behavior uh, based on the patterns that it has captured from that data set. And if you have some image data set or some NLP data set, which is racist, let's say, uh, it's gonna show that behavior when it comes to inference as well. So I agree that working on data has become very, very important. And, and our approach should be data centric rather than ML centric. Talk about um, NLP, which um, is very contentious because that's probably the lowest um, accuracy area of all other implementation in neural networks. Uh, I've had Valid Sabah um, on my show, who's um, one of the ardent critics of um, NLP. And um, he is at um, serious agreements with um, John Lacuna about that. And he talks about um, a new 
field, which is natural language understanding, and he's working on that. And what he's found, or he's claimed to have found, is um, a language agnostic structure um, for linguistics, in which um, no matter what language um, is being used, um, the overall structure um, or universal grammar of the language must dictate the intelligent responses of the machine. For example, let's talk about um, GPD, uh, sorry, OpenAI's uh, Codex platform um, that um, generates code uh, from the textual descriptions. And one of the critics and uh, criticism that can be leveled towards that is that it only takes code that you have put into the training without being smart and generating um, different human-like um, code modifications. For example, you were talking earlier about um, do you have to create hash maps or do you simply create arrays and things like this? So that's the kind of thing that Codex cannot actually perform. And I was just wondering, how do you see um, NLP evolving in the future? What are the major reasons why their accuracy is not jumping um, to what we would call human acceptable level? Um, even though there are major uh, advantages, like simple ones, um, you can dictate um, Amazon um, Assistant, Siri, Google Assistant, um, and other things. Uh, but how do you see that evolving? So just a disclaimer, uh, I, I, I'm not too much into NLP space, uh, but I can, I can, you know, say something based on my real life experience. So I, I had this Google Pixel and a few years back, the assistant, Google assistant, you know, wasn't that great, but they have improved the accuracy of that so much that if I want to do simple tasks, like set up an alarm, call my wife, I use it all the time. It's a clear, like a real life implication that NLP is having uh, on me in terms of convenience. Let's say I'm driving a car. I, I want to just set up an alarm for an, in an important meeting tomorrow. I can just talk to my Google assistant and can do it. Without NLP, this wouldn't be possible. Talking about the whole Codex platform, see all these issues, first of all, are complex. Um, I don't know if you heard about GitHub's Copilot. Uh, did you? Yes, yeah. I think I was yeah. referring to that. <laughs> oh, you're referring to that only? Okay. I, don't you think that that's one and the same thing on the Codex that's modified for the Copilot? Um, because I think that's almost the same thing. It's or almost the same thing. thing. It's so the way, and I had to look into the details. I've, I, I have not looked into the technical details of the whole thing, but GitHub Copilot um, scans through the millions of lines of data, uh, code that it, they have. Uh, just, uh, just say, a quick search. Um, and Codex actually is the commercial version, um, um, which is called GitHub Copilot. So that's the same thing. That's the same thing. Okay, cool. So, but one thing, uh, that is important here is, let's say I want to uh, search search an array using some custom criteria, or I want to merge two arrays so that it creates a sorted array. And just giving a simple example. In GitHub Copilot, you can write a comment and hit tab, and it will write that code for you. Now, how does it do it? Maybe it's using some, again, I don't know the technical details, using some NLP AI to scan through millions of lines of GitHub code that the model has already seen during the training and giving you smart suggestion. But it can give you multiple suggestions as well, right? If you don't like this suggestion, you can hit next. You can hit next. You can hit next. Okay, I like this suggestion because this code is probably memory efficient. Now you hit accept. I think they would probably have some feed. They have or they would have a feedback, mechan feedback mechanism where they will try to gain better understanding on you know, what kind of code blocks are accepted and maybe they can fine tune their models or improve their models uh, in a way that you can get to a level where for certain common operations, for example, this is very common in Python. You have a directory and the directory has sub n number of subdirectories you want to go through all the subdirectories and read every files, could be JSON, and you want to process them in certain way. Every programmer in the world would be writing the same line of like, there will be like two, four loops, you know, so that auto structure would be 
universally same. So how do you use now, I'm just thinking aloud, GitHub Copilot to come up with that definitive answer that, okay, you know, if you want to read um, subdirectories in Python and then read every files, this is the best code that you can have. So yeah, I'm seeing that it's still evolving, but people probably are aware about the limitation and they're working on uh, the mechanisms, you know, or you can just combine NLP with a bunch of heuristics to come up with the better answer in the way it should work. You know, it should solve your given problem. And I don't see any issues with that happening. I have used Kite. Like I don't have, I didn't get a, an access of GitHub Copilot yet, but I have used this tool called Kite. And that works really well. I mean, I just type in at the, the same Python example. I write some code. It auto completes. It saves me so much time. So to me, NLP, so that is like for me, NLP making a direct impact on my life. That's very interesting. Actually, on the co-pilot um, thing, I, mean, I have access to that and I've got it like six months ago um, and i would be more than happy to actually share it with you if you want to just um, play and um, do something with this. Uh, but let's talk about something else. Um, since you are good at so many things, um, so many of the time when I am talking to people, I have to think about, you know, should I ask this question and does it actually fall in a zoom in or not with you? It's, it's very, you know, I can take the liberty of doing so many things. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the ETL part of the whole picture. And um, I think it's probably a problem for Facebook, um, Amazon, and bigger companies, but the smaller companies, don't you think using um, hash maps um, or link lists um, or different kind of arrays, that is kind of becoming irrelevant with the huge storage that's available, um, the compute power that we have, uh, the in-memory, um, storage uh, for tools like Spark um, and then uh, different AZs around the world. Do you think it's becoming irrelevant or do you still have to be smart about how you structure your um, data um, within uh, a program? I think data structures and algorithm, as I say, like they are, they, they are going to stay for eternity. What you need to do is you need to combine your data structure knowledge with some of the principles of distributed computing. The way we are solving uh, today's big data problems is by using distributed computing. We are not changing underlying data structures. We were using Panda's data frame, for example, to deal with a small set of data, okay? Now, when it comes to big data, even Panda's data frames can't handle it. So they came up with, NVIDIA came up with something called Rapids, which is, which is a data frame on steroids, you know, on, on distributed computing. And then there is another thing called Dask. So Dask, Rapids, and Apache Spark data frame. So all these data frames are uh, designed to work in a distributed environment. Rapids is customized to work on GPUs. The other tools are generally designed to work on a distributed environment. So the the crux, the hash maps and trees, binaries, I don't think they'll go away. They will just stay. We will be writing wrappers around it, which can work really well on a, on a distributed environment, you know? And we have seen a lot of distributed frameworks coming in, for example, Apache Spark. Then it makes the whole thing look like a black box to you. You don't care, like, you know, how it distributes things underneath. Compute power has been has becoming very, very cheap, you know? So instead of kind of reinventing the wheel, you keep your uh, basic bolts and gears the same, and then you write and you have those things execute on a distributed environment using distributed frameworks and, and hardware and, and things like that. Uh, so I believe, I don't, I don't see if, if uh, the use of, I don't see the use of data structures going away. I mean, there are custom ways of doing things. Of course, people come with a custom, like some customizations on top of your basic data structures. But, but yeah, other than that, they are pretty useful. You have talked about um, deep learning from the implementation point of view, where you talk about TensorFlow and Keras, but there's things that you have not talked about yet, um, which is 
um, in some tools that might be very beneficial for the beginners, um, like um, Jeremy Howard's Fast API. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of beginners um, dabble with this. Uh, he has a wonderful way of teaching. You know, I absolutely love his work. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, do you have any plans to talk about that? And uh, what has your personal experience be, uh, has been with uh, the tool, if you ever had um, used this tool? Um, talk to us a little about that. Uh, so Fast API is something is I'm going to explore. It's just that, uh, there is uh, producing content eats off so much of my time and with my busy schedule, I'm just not uh, getting enough time to cover all those topics. But so many of my subscribers have uh, sent me this feedback. Uh, I want to start a series soon on PyTorch as well. Uh, but yeah, TensorFlow, I did an entire series and and I'm feeling like TensorFlow is still at a lower level. So I think you, you're better off here using fast API or some of the higher label, label APIs, or I've, I've heard that even PyTorch is a little better in terms of convenience, at least uh, compared to TensorFlow. But I wanted to cover the basic blocks because if you're using TensorFlow, it's, it gives you a lot of options. You can customize things so much, you know, you can write things from scratch, uh, but yeah. Fast API and PyTorch. When I, I think when I started this series, I seriously didn't give much thought. I just started it. And it's my habit that if I start something, I want to finish it. <laughs> Maybe let's say that that's probably the reason I'm not able to um, cover some of the higher le level APIs such as Fast API. Yeah, I mean, you cannot make video about everything. You know, you got to start somewhere. Um, and then this has been an interesting uh, discussion. And uh, where do you um, stand on this um, epic battle between uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow? I've had um, the creator of uh, PyTorch Geometric um, on my podcast. Um, such a wonderful guy. To know now they're collaborated with Stanford's uh, Open Graph uh, Benchmark um, Data Site Initiative. Um, and Matthias uh, Fay, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, um, but he talked about the fact that it's more research oriented uh, tool, PyTorch, and many of the publications coming out of that um, are from the academia versus uh, TensorFlow, which is more of an industrial side thing. Um, and um, have you dabbled with both of them? Which one is your favorite or? Well, I have a couple of data scientists who have experience with both and those data scientist friends that I, that I talked to, uh, they're saying PyTorch was, PyTorch, by the way, PyTorch is rapidly used in the industry. Okay, it's very widespread. It's not like it's in academia. PyTorch is, I would say more popular than TensorFlow when you talk about the, the industry, you know, corporate world, uh, because I think it's a little easier to use compared to TensorFlow, although I'm not 100% sure, but TensorFlow, all right, let's say this. TensorFlow 1.0 wasn't that great, but they have made huge improvements in TensorFlow 2.0. So now, as far as the corporate sector is concerned, they are kind of neck to neck. But if you have people, you know, who have PyTorch experience uh, in those days where TensorFlow 1.0 wasn't as convenient, then those people will be biased and they will be using PyTorch for new projects. But if someone is starting out, I think both are equally like good choices. Although there are some aspects of TensorFlow, which I don't like, and I have conveyed my feedback to TensorFlow team. I'm in contact with someone in TensorFlow team and I keep on talking with those folks and convey my feedback and, and they're open, you know, they're open-minded, they're addressing uh, those feedbacks as well. So yeah, as, as far as I think corporate sector is concerned, I would say they are running almost neck to neck and, and we'll see like, what new features or uh, how how they build these new versions. Uh, I think if someone from PyTorch or TensorFlow team is listening to this podcast, I think they need to remember one thing, which is they need to keep their API super simple because these APIs are returned by some of the smartest folks in the world. And they will take few things for granted. Their API, their outer API interface needs to be as simple as English language. That has become number one requirement, you know, if you want your framework to be successful. Very good point, actually. And I think most of the beginners or data scientists, citizen data scientists that I've met, um, they have this um, consistent complaint about these tools, um, especially programming languages. And I should talk to you about this, actually. I mean, you're a programmer. Uh, one of the problems with uh, these languages is that 
how long does it actually take before it looks like a normal English language syntax? I mean, this Python indentation problem is a perennial problem. I mean, everyone's so sick of that. Uh, some people are moving towards um, Julia. Um, loops are, uh, even from the beginning school days, when I had to learn for, for I, you have to loop at a certain time, then you end the loop. I mean, why does it have to be so complicated? I mean, you could write that in natural language, like, you know, loop this condition for certain time and close that what's the problem with programmers <laughs> very good question maybe github copilot is a first step you know right now you write a comment it writes a code tomorrow you can just write a comment and it will transpile that into the functioning code so now you have a bunch of comments and that's your code <laughs> maybe we'll get to that level who knows this whole nlp thing uh will get us to that level but python i mean I'm a huge fan of Python. It, it has brought us to that level to some extent. I want to read a file. I can remember that syntax in my head. Okay, with open F as F for line in F, do whatever. I was a C++ programmer for many years. I could never remember the syntax of, okay, how to read a file and then read every line one by one. I would always Google. So Python has at least brought us that level of convenience. And it's just a matter of evolution. Um, maybe who knows, either it will be tool like GitHub Copilot, which will um, just do the transpilation, you know, of converting your comments into the working code, or maybe we'll come up with a new language altogether, you know, new syntax. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't have any, I have not thought about it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think for, uh, from people uh, outside the programming world, they have very simple solution for everything. Probably they don't think about implementation. For example, why I still have to write PD dot read and it should go to CSV and then give the path mm -hmm. for the code. I mean, it should be drag and drop. I mean, now they're coming tools um, for Python. I don't know if you're familiar with a tool called Mito um that can import your file within the python jupyter notebook and then you can you know do this just like excel like transformation within the um cell um and then save it and then you can save the code also just for the next etl pipelines and for the future um so you know, people are finding the importance of making it more gui based easy for people um, but the programmer themselves like hardcore programmers they're like okay well if you figure it out figure it out if not you know it's not my problem <laughs> but let's move on to um something very interesting that you take um huge pride uh, and i guess all programmers will take huge pride in your deep learning working station which is a super expensive 3500 um dollars computer um talk us about that is there a hope for people who do not use M nvidia at the moment for deep learning or for example i'm i am on m1 m apple which is absolutely wonderful and i have no problem for that but for deep learning i still have to you know use um jupyter notebook some kind of um, online cloud service um and rent out a gpu uh, do you do you see it changing at any point in the time yeah so i mean I have so many people ask me the same question and to be honest i mean i didn't want to build this uh heavy machine actually it's just that nvidia sent me this gpu for free so i i'm one of those lucky ones who can get how do you actually do that do i have to write them email i need one also <laughs> i don't know they located they somehow found me and they sent me an email and hey i mean you know we want to send you this gpu i'm like sure why not <laughs> i didn't contact them but maybe i mean maybe i you you can just contact them uh but to get back to your question, um, so your natural choice right now is use, use Google Collab. You get some free credits, so use that. And then you can pay per use. You know, pay per use is becoming kind of like a standard model nowadays. So just use that, uh, pay as, as you go on cloud. And I'm hoping as time goes, these hardware will become more and more cheaper. So maybe, you know, at that point, you can have your own hardware as well. Is it only because of the GPU themselves or is it just like the NVIDIA ecosystem is so good um, that people generally use it uh, for deep learning? Uh, for example, what does Apple have to do um, to make their GPUs good for uh, deep learning? Well, it's, it's because NVIDIA 
NVIDIA as a company, they're master in, in, in GPU. They have been doing GPUs for so many years. They have become so good at it. And NVIDIA has a, I, I used to work for NVIDIA at some, at some point of time. And I know NVIDIA has got a very strong leadership, very, they think in terms of, you know, futuristic mindset. And because of that, they are able to invest so much in their hardware improvement and so much kind of diversify their business into deep learning, uh, in that kind of deep learning as a business. And they are able to customize or build specific hardware for just for deep learning. They recently sent me this NVIDIA DGX station, which is built just for data scientists, you know? So their, their focus is very clear. They used to be in online gaming. They're still in online, uh, not online, like online, offline gaming both. By the way, they're coming up with Netflix-like platform for gaming. Google is also doing something like that. So gaming is their business, but they're seeing a huge potential in the learning area. So just the sheer focus and years of experience is probably the reason why NVIDIA GPUs are so good at deep learning. It's very interesting you talk about the um, NVIDIA and why they have such a um, great position to be in this market, and especially now. I think their business are, is being hurt quite bad with the chip shortage um, and the TSMC being, being the only one um, that's making those chips. And probably Apple was um, the clear voyant um, in that whole scenario where they were able to see the need of making their own um, chips and now uh, Google has recently announced, um, announced Tensor, their mobile chip, um, which they have introduced in their new phone, um, Google Pixel. Um, have you heard about that? Oh yeah, I was. I want to buy that. Uh, so I, I, I was just looking at the a review video on MHKBD YouTube channel because I have Google Pixel two and I want to upgrade to Pixel six. And I heard about that chip. I have not looked into details yet. But I know, I know from the TPU, you know, Google has this TPUs, TensorFlow processing yes. units in their data centers. And I think in one of the Google keynotes, Sundar Pichai announced that they want to become AI first company. So I'm not surprised that they would be investing so much on, on AI hardware as well. Yeah, I guess you know, it goes um, hand in hand with hardware and software. And Apple was the first company who realized the importance of having the hardware um, and, and the ecosystem before um, the software. Um, I guess uh, this is uh, the spat between Facebook and Apple that um, happened like a couple of months ago where um, they gave users an option to opt out of um, those ads and tracking um, softwares, um, which Facebook wasn't ha I'm very happy about that. Um, but let's get back to um, some of the things that you're doing for the community, giving back um, um, a very um, healthy initiative that I've seen um, within the AI community. You have a Discord server, um, such a vibrant community um, of wonderful people. So many thankful people who have gotten jobs because of you. Um, I was talking about one of these um, guys from Pakistan, actually, who got a job in a very um, high rated um, uh, community of engineers because of your videos. Um, and he was so, so thankful. How do you actually find time to maintain that community, talk to them, um, you know, contribute um, and create a culture where uh, people not only learn, but they share it with others. Um, and one of the posts that I was reading from you, and you talked about the fact that the reason that you're so successful is because you've been able to give out and you request everyone else to give out. Um, and this I find um, so helpful um, and touching because um, somehow there's, there's a belief that scarcity um, is the key to maintain your power. Um, and I believe I come from a s mindset of opulence and not s scarcity. Uh, so how did you get um, into that? And uh, how do you actually manage such a community with limited time? So my Discord server is, I think, more than 11,000 people right now. And to be honest, I'm not very active there. But what I do uh, to kind of keep that community thriving is I identify people who are contributing and I promote them as mentors or admins uh, within that Discord server. And these are the fo folks uh, who are really passionate, who are curious. And the most important thing is they have a lot of empathy and they want to help others. I promote them as mentors uh, on my Discord server. And then 
I try to do them a favor. Let's see if they're looking for a job and they're looking for a referral. Um, my brother's company, Atlic Technologies, which is a which is an awesome software and mobile app development and data analytics company based in India. They had need of some of the engineers and I immediately uh, picked some of the uh, mentors from my Discord server, because I know these are the folks who are very curious, who can learn things fast, fast who, who can be great team players. So, you know, those people uh, just goes through the interview process directly. Like they don't have to go through a resume screening process. So they people see the benefit of contributing. And at the same time, they get this feeling of giving back. Now, to talk about your point on scarcity, and this is, I think, one of the things that even Noel uh, Ravi Kant talks about in his, uh, you know, videos and uh, talks, is that we live in a, we, we don't have this concept of scarcity anymore. The world is evolving, it's full of opportunities, full of resources, and we are becoming more and more collaborative. And if you want to be successful in collaborative environment, giving things back without maintaining a scorecard is I think number one trait that you need to have in order to succeed, you know, in, in, in this type of environment. So I have personally seen uh, that the more I have helped people, the more it has come back to me. So that law of reciprocity is always at work. You know, it, it always works. And I've seen multiple times that, you know, if I have given X, I have always received two X back. So it's, then it's very cool that you're doing some work without any expectation and you get two X return without even asking for it. So you don't have to, in your mind, in that process, when you're teaching someone, when you're working on a project, you don't have to ask for specific thing. It just naturally comes back. And it's so much convenient and you can focus so much on your work that it kind of becomes an obvious thing that everyone should do that. When I use Python on my own, I mean, the first thing I think about is, is there are so many contributors around the world who are putting a lot of their free time in open sourcing this language, you know, in open sourcing all these tools like Pandas, Python, TensorFlow. So it almost, at some point, it becomes almost like a duty that you also need to do your part in whatever capacity you can. So yeah, these are some of the reasons that keeps me motivated in, in this whole giving back theme. Um. Devil, it's so heartwarming talking to unsung heroes um, like you. I mean, the, one of the purposes of having a podcast, um, at least for me, was to bring uh, people um, like Josh Charmer um, and Shanine from Data Professor and, and people like you who have done remarkable work, not only for um, your community, but for humanity in general, by telling them the importance of sharing, um, overcoming um, hurdles, um, obstacles, uh, battling with tough times, um, hopelessness, and giving them the tools to be able to cope not only in their professional life, but also in personal life. Um, it's been a blast um, talking to you. Um, I know that you have um, dysphonia and it, it's very hard for you to talk for a longer time. And it's been a long podcast for which I'm very thankful and grateful um, that you have you were able to make time for us. Um, thank you so much. And um, do you have any message for people who are listening to you today? Well, thanks very much for inviting me. It was an amazing conversation. I enjoyed it, uh, you know, throughout this time period. The only message, last message I would give to people is the, the world is becoming more and more flat. You know, there is this book called The World is Flat, I think by Adam Friedman. I forgot the name of the author, but uh, that book is all about how internet is creating a world of equal opportunities. You know, before internet, if you are living in US versus India or Pakistan, it would be a humongous difference. So just the fact that you're born at one place decides what kind of opportunities you have in your life. Internet came in, transportation first came transportation so that 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 
that gap was reduced. Then came internet. That gap was further reduced. Now came the whole pandemic situation, work from home, uh, every country improving their internet infrastructure, video streaming becoming so much accessible. The world is becoming more and more flat, open source, you know, cloud solutions. All of these factors are creating a world where everyone has an equal opportunity. So it doesn't matter what part of the world you are in. You could be living in a distant town in Africa, but let's live with a hope that you can build an amazing future. You can build next Microsoft or Google or next Tesla. You have those means, you have those resources. So always aim higher. I mean, if any student or anyone is listening who is working towards the goal, I will say always aim higher. Take enough help of internet. There are so many amazing YouTube channels out there where you can learn amazing things for free. This three blue, one brown channel that I'm talking about uh, for learning math. I don't think you can even learn that kind of math in, even in Stanford. Now you are a student sitting in a, you know, a rural village of Egypt. You have the access to education, which is even better than Stanford or Harvard. How cool is that? So just be aware about the opportunities that you have with you and don't look at the negativity. So the internet has brought a lot of opportunities, but it has brought a lot of negativity or negativity uh, around you as well. So just get rid of all the negativity from your life, look at the opportunity and just focus on your goals and anyone can build amazing future um, in today's world. I have one of the subscribers who lives in a distant rural village of Rajasthan where, you know, they don't even get a water. Now this guy, because of Reliance Geo, which is a big company in India, which is providing easy internet access, you know, easy, very, very cheap internet access throughout India. That guy in third year of his engineering college is making more than $2,000 by doing freelancing work on Upwork. Now, this is the person who barely, uh, you know, like uh, clears his exams, but he's so much passionate about coding. He learns everything online and he earns an income, which is with which he can live like a king style lifestyle in, in his village. And so many amazing uh, stories are happening. Uh, so yeah, world is full of opportunities. Number one, get rid of all your negativities and work towards your goal with a discipline and make use of internet in a wise way. Thank you so much.